This is Religion and Theology, a podcast from the Center for Theology and Religious Studies. On the 16th of September, Professor Catherine Keller came to CTR to give an open lecture with the title Political Theology of the Earth. Johanna Gustafsson Lundberg and Elisabeth Jäle of CTR will give the introduction. So good evening everyone to this very interesting lecture that we are about to to hear. Uh, on behalf of the Center for Theology and Religious Studies, it's a pleasure and an honor, I would say, to welcome Catherine Keller, Professor of Constructive Theology at Drew University. Professor Keller's research on social and ecological justice, post-structuralist theory and feminist theology has had an important impact on contemporary theological debates, not least, not the least on climate change and the quests for new political and theological spaces. In her latest book, as we can see here, Political Theology of the Earth, she elaborates on the possibility to find a secular religious, one word, space where destructive destructive dichotomies can be destabilized to make way for other creative and unexpected potentialities to grow. And before we let you come up here, Catherine, to our keynote, I will leave the floor for, maybe I should say, another key professor, Elisabeth Jalle. It's a great pleasure for me to be able to introduce a very close friend for decades. We have known each other since I was a visiting scholar in Princeton in the early 19s, and so Catherine has become one of my best friends. And especially since we share so much theological reflections, as well as networks. And we all know that Catherine is involved in so many networks. She has a real ecumenical spirit, and she talks to everybody in their own tongue, you could almost say with Hebrew scholars, with uh, Catholic scholar, with uh, Methodists, with Lutherans. <laughs> you really have been in dialogue with many of us. The most recent dialogue we had was in relation to Scandinavian creation theology, which was one, my heritage, and you have a contribution in this little booklet. We share the same challenges from four of injustices and a desire for a just world. And so the Luxtropian notion of interdependence and a call, divine calling to live with and for other human beings and the ecological web, web of interdependence where we find ourselves today. This is what we share, among many other things. During all these years I've known Catherine, it's been so interesting to see from a distance, sometimes a little bit closer, how she has developed her own style, theopolitical style, really a language capacity of being a theological poet. And today she will give a talk on, based or relate, in relation to her most recent book, that uh, in a review, it has been introduced as a most galvanizing new book, Political Th Theology of the Earth. And here, apocalypse doesn't mean what many think it means, the coming of the end times. This is not to say that Catherine Kelly dismissed the crisis that faces us, quite the opposite. But drawing on studies of the Pauline epistles, Keller shows that the passage in the first Corinthian is believed, believed to mean the end time is more accurately translated the time that remains. That is the time we have. Um, so, to leave that behind, not to take much more time, I just want to mention, you can see some of her very productive, apart from being 
a devoted advisor and teacher, she comes out with a book each other year. And this was very one of her recent ones after her dissertation in 90, 96. This, this came in 1996. And then followed by The Face of the Deep, I just wanted to have seen them, where she's really sort of challenging and discussing the uh, traditional dogma of creatio ex nihilo, creation out of nothing. And on the mystery, it may be one of her most well-read book. It's the most accessible, I would say, and it's a wonderful book that I've used a lot in my own writing when I wrote Passionate Embrace, among other things. And then she embraced with negative theology in relation to process theology and kusana in the cloud of impossible. And now, just recently, this book, Political Theology of the Earth. So we are so happy you're here, Catherine, and that we could snatch you on your way to Stockholm. And um, the floor is yours. Welcome. Well, thank you all. Um, it, it is it is such a uh, such a rare kind of pleasure to be able to be welcomed by such a rare sort of friend. Uh, so I'm, I'm I'm very grateful. Uh, the feeling of, of closeness and intimacy mixes with the sense of foreignness and strangeness because I really don't know most of you, and I can't speak your language. <laughs> Uh, hey, uh, I'm, I'm uh, sorry to have to give you another opportunity to practice your English. If I'm speaking too quickly, uh, maybe a, a little a little wave from here at this gesture might might slow me down a little bit. Um, but thank you uh, for coming today to think with me about politics, theology, and the earth. It's an odd moment in history, isn't it? When all three of these topics come shadowed with crisis, with vulnerability, and with uncertainty. The threats of populist nationalisms are rendering democracy fragile and combine oddly with the deepening fragility of the mainline Christianity of secular societies. But these fragilities all come wrapped in the earth, as does all embodied life uh, that we know of. And that encompassing earth used to be a kind of comfortable truism, a background fact, not terribly interesting unless you're planning your vacation or unless you are a geologist or a romantic poet or an environmentalist. Most of us with a political conscience said yes, yes to good ecology, and maybe even more of us in Sweden, but we worked mostly to address the human crises of our political bodies. And for a subpopulation, uh, such as a theological school represents, our religious bodies. And now we find ourselves in this odd situation where the crisis of global warming has come out of the background and is going to be the ground of all other problems. So friendly talk about the weather has lost its innocence, hasn't it? You know, someone mentions what an exceptionally lovely, warm northern European summer it was. And then there's that pause and the glance down, you know, and I have bouncing into my brain. Uh, my friend just arrived from Berlin six weeks ago saying it was 40 degrees centigrade there for three days. This has broken all known records. Um, the fun of just easy talk about the weather, it's gone. As you all know, the crisis is not going to recede again in the foreseeable human future. It will only grow, though not so fast and not so much here in Scandinavia. 
you're going to have a lot of American billionaires <laughs> going in, in, coming here and building their, their special retreats. It's already happening. But the crisis will now provide the critical horizon for all human struggles, for all coming publics. In English, one wants to say, our other big issues used to trump the earth. To trump, a verb meaning to relativize, to override, as with a, a trump card, and, and to defeat. So now one can no longer use the word trump without a shudder of apocalypse. <laughs> and unfortunately, our 45th president's trumping daily, daily, of more US environmental agreements or regulations is not just an American problem. We have, long before Trump, exercised disproportionate economic impact on the globe and its atmosphere, on the Earth body, and on its capacity to breathe. Sweden has worked disproportionately hard in the opposite direction. I'm not saying you're perfect, but whew, what a difference. So there is a tragic edge of injustice to read as I prepared for this trip about the Kebenekaise. I read that, quote, the mountain peak known to Swedes as their country's highest can no longer lay claim to the title due to global heating, scientists have confirmed, as the glacier at its summit shrinks amid soaring Arctic temperatures. This is quite a symbol, said Gunhild Nines Roskvist, a Stockholm University geography professor who has been measuring the glacier annually for several years. A very obvious, his words, very clear signal to everyone in Sweden that things are changing. The U.S. relation to the Nordic countries remains, on this front, a little bit creepy. So at the end of my summer vacation, I bumped into a nice little newspaper in Tacoma, Washington, with a headline article about the glacier melt in Greenland. A New York University geologist was quoted as saying, this summer's measurements announce, I quote, the end of the earth. You know, usually scientists are the last to use apocalyptic language. But then days later, just three days later, back in New York, another front page story about Greenland. Trump was so pissed off that Denmark's prime minister would not sell him <laughs> Greenland that he canceled his visit. So his fans, of course, do not notice the irony that he had in 2018 urged more Nordic white people to move to the United States, as opposed to immigrants from, yeah, let me quote his presidential oratory, those shithole nations. What rhetoric. <laughs> I will not let him trump this talk, however. As political thinkers in the US rightly insist, he is not the cause of our white racism, our imperial capitalism, or our carbon emissions. He is a grotesque symptom. Because of the situation of our planet, the symptom is one more warning of a dangerous situation. Indeed, so dangerous that the language of the end of the world, the end of the habitable earth, the language that is of apocalypse has become inescapable, even among the most secular of thinkers from whom we now read, for instance, of the German insect Armageddon, or then the insect apocalypse of the Americas. The novelist Jonathan Franzen just published an article in The New Yorker subtitled, The Climate Apocalypse is Coming. So such language can no longer be dismissed as hysterical or as fundamentalist. And so, <laughs> I must first of all clarify the use, at least my use, of the term apocalypse. I consider it crucial to correct, whenever possible, the misuse of the term, religious or secular misuse, to mean the end of the world. There is 
no end of the world in the Bible. There are terrors, there are terrible losses, there are tribulations, there are last days, there are ends of the age, but not the termination of the world. In the Apocalypse of John, there is the end of the Roman world and of its imperial economy with catastrophes, with mass death of sea and earth life. But the nations in their earth diversity, their kings are all there. In the New Jerusalem, they're coming in with their crowns, same old nations, but no longer part of the empire which went down. There is radical transformation. There is new creation. Not anything as neat as the end of the world. So apocalypse maybe should be read as the Greek word that it is for revelation, for disclosure, not closure. However many particular worlds get tragically shut down, possibility does get opened up. So by facing the destruction, might we open some possibility of new creation, some possibility, even some hope beyond optimism and pessimism? As Ernst Bloch showed so extensively in The Principle of Hope, every revolution in the modern world was indebted to biblical eschatology as mediated through the apocalypse. So it's radical hope <laughs> that we're talking about as the inheritance of the prophets. So I am, I am uh, meditating today with you, actually, upon a kind of triple apocalypse. The first is the political, the apocalypse of democracy with the special threat to non-white and immigrant populations. Second is the broadest threat, that of global warming, which has made apocalyptic language so respectable now among secularists. And most anti-democratic forces remain vociferously anti-environmentalist. So the political apocalypse is surrounded by the eco-apocalypse in a kind of relation of mutual intensification. The third, the least discussed publicly, is the apocalypse of Christianity, which comes last because, because it is actually the perspective enfolding these reflections. And so what is disclosed in our triple apocalypse? This will show itself at one level as a set of exceptionalisms. They shut history into systems of oppressive supremacisms. To open it up again, history, <laughs> requires some disclosure in all three registers, politics, earth, theology, of the secularized Christian implications. So, number one, which will be the longest. The first register of this triadic apocalypse, the political in which Christian theology got translated into secular forms of sovereignty. So the discourse of political theology here comes into play. It makes visible what otherwise can remain dangerously invisible, the hidden operation within secular politics of theological justifications of power, that is, of a divine omnipotence translated into unilateral power, top down. In the United States, a long history of democracy pivots perilously, dangerously, around the US exceptionalism. And as Kelly Brown Douglas, the womanist theologian, has shown, the US exceptionalism grows inseparably from the start with a white exceptionalism that itself migrated from early modern Anglo-Saxon exceptionalism. Let me note that the preoccupation with ethnic identity develops in England through the 16th, 17th century readings of, of Tacitus and his Germania, with his vivid descriptions of the blonde-haired and egalitarian Germanic tribes. This ethnic preoccupation was part of the shift from Roman Catholicism to Anglo-Saxon Protestantism, Anglicanism. 
In the US, though, it quickly became the white racism that one finds even in the writings of a democratic hero like Benjamin Franklin. He writes, this is an early letter, but he wrote, while we are clearing the country of dark woods, why should we be darkening it with Africans? And then he goes on to say, really, there are, some, there are very few people here in America who are truly white. Uh, only a few Germans, and not only them, just, just the Saxons. <laughs> so you Swedes, not really white. <laughs> but the white exceptionalism is not so much spreading in the United States as coming out. It is disclosing itself, <laughs> apocalyptain. And apparently, the English-speaking symptomatology of whiteness exemplifies a condition <laughs> from which now much of Europe is suffering. So I demonstrate in political theology of the earth how that racialized exceptionalism functions not only to amp up our own, our own United States internal history of white supremacism, but to join our immigrant nation to a multinational nationalism of anti-immigrant politics. And by the way, this is, this is very much what Hannah Arendt warned about in 1946. She said there's a new emerging white supremacism uh, that is taking the form of a new, that will take the form of, of hostility towards immigration and a new fascist international, 1946. But calling it populist, I think, is a problem. It suggests that the populace, the people, belong to the right. And of course, many do, partly because of the left's failure to overcome our image as overeducated cosmopolitan elites. At least this is true in the US where a toxic class-based resentment meets not just assertive women, LGBTQ, and ecological folk, but finds all talk of sexism, heterosexism, or racism to be elitist insults. For this reason, the political philosopher William Connolly prefers to call it not populism, but aspirational fascism. Not yet fascism. Trump does not have fascist power and fortunately may not have the disciplined consistency with which to achieve it. But his politics aspires to top down power uninhibited by democratic negotiation. This proximity to fascism makes the original source of the recent conversations on political theology relevant. The phrase political theology, is actually now a kind of fourfold irony. It was formulated in mockery of a mockery. Bakunin, the 19th century Russian uh, revol revolutionary anarchist, actually first coined it in mockery of fellow Italians who find revolutionary motivation in their Catholicism. <laughs> And then Carl Schmitt, the legal theorist turned Nazi, mocks Bakunin, even as then Schmitt retrieves the Christian meaning of political theology. And the current use of Schmitt in thinkers of the secular left from A to Z, Agamben to Zizek, performs its own irony, as does the current interdisciplinary opening for theological engagement that I'm trying to do here. So the heart of political theology is probably familiar to some of you in Schmidt's words, all significant concepts of the modern theory of the state are secularized theological concepts. And then the omnipotent God became the omnipotent lawgiver. So, the sovereign omnipotence of the state, and particularly of the Führer, comes down to the first sentence of his book, Political Theology. 
souverän ist, wer, den, wer über den Ausnahmezustand entscheidet. Sovereign is the one who decides in the exception. The German Ausnahme exposes the situation of exception. Ausnehmen, take out. <laughs> And it is synonymous in German with emergency. So the exceptional leader unite, who is taken out of the collective unites his folk in the emergency, which comes down to the threat posed by the alien as the enemy. So then the political is defined as the friend versus foe dynamic. Tell me who your enemy is, right? Schmidt, and I will tell you who you are. There's something to it. Dependent on the Christian background to politics, Schmidt then has to argue that love of enemy is, of course, not applicable to politics. <laughs> so this political antagonism that is in this theory the very heart of politics needs both internal and external enemies. And for Schmidt's party in the 30s, that meant the Jews and the Allies. In the US, the long history of white racism offers now up African-American citizens as internal enemy, as it locks increasingly onto immigrants, whole scary caravans coming up from Latin America as the external enemy. Hence, we have the unifying farce of the wall, which will fix all. But of course, those of us on the liberal progressive spectrum also get unified by our enemies. And really, I, I hope that Trump has that unifying effect on the Democratic Party in time for the 2020 election. The signs aren't encouraging. Uh, but should that dynamic friend-foe define our politics? Connolly suggests as an alternative to the sovereign antagonism what he calls respectful agonism. Agonism discloses its own agony, and it means struggle, which may or may not get simplified into us versus them. <laughs> us, spell that, U-S. <laughs> I theologize this difficult respect uh, in my book as amorous agonism, a love of the enemy that recognizes the enmity as enmity. Uh, my colleague and friend Serene Jones has done much work on the concept of revolutionary love in this context. Struggle can be with friends as well as with enemies. And it works not to unify in homogeneity, except maybe in an election, but to gather in solidarity. This allows one to define the political as a struggle across critical difference, a struggle across critical difference for a more common good, not just the common good, which we would all define very differently, but a more common good. The common good is not one. Thus Fred Moten and Stefano Harvey wrote The Undercommons, Fugitive Practice and Black Study, a book in resistance to the false white unity of liberalism. And taking aim at the Schmittian presumption, they challenge every sovereign decision and its degraded miniature every national unity of home sweet home. A more common good will keep faith with the under commons. It will disclose, sometimes with apocalyptic vehemence, the varieties of ethnocentrism or racism masquerading as the common good. For a political theology of the earth, What then is the alternative to the sovereign exceptionalism? I think we might call it a political intersectionalism. 
This term intersectionalism comes from African-American womanists working for alliance, not unity, alliance across multiple issues, across deep differences of race and of class and of gender and of sexuality to make possible what Connolly calls a broad spectrum, radically democratic coalition. And of course, international alliances for immigrant justice now become critical and difficult, as in the US, race works differently and often trumps questions of religion, whereas in Europe, it is an Islamophobia more consistently mingling with the ethnocentrism of a renewed white Christian identity. It's overlapping related problems, but different emphases. If we find ways politically and religiously to form coalitions of great difference on behalf of immigrant and human rights, global intersections crossing the planet, they will crisscross in unpredictable ways the neoliberal version of economics that currently organizes global politics. The white and US versions of exceptionalism surely go hand in hand with the exceptionalism built into late capitalism, the exceptionalism of the 1%. Political power shifted over several decades in neoliberal regimes from state constraint of capitalist motives now to state subservience to capitalism. In any case, Miguel de Bestigui writes, it is no longer a matter of governing because of the market and the situations of inequality it can generate, but it is a matter of governing for the market. But is that neoliberalism strengthened uh, by populist or aspirationally fascist reactions going on across the globe in the name of anti-globalism? Or is that neoliberalism now coming undone with the globalism? <laughs> The standard left analysis of neoliberalism, neoliberalism as the problem may be shaking along with international treaties as manifest in Brexit and as the current US religio-political antagonism toward every form of globalism, economic included, uh, is showing a, a recent religious, uh, religious right textbook called Trumpocalypse. Trumpocalypse is being celebrated. Uh, actually, already in uh, the year of the election, uh, made the opposition to the global economy very, uh, very explicit, uh, along with the, the opposition to global ecumenism, to the United Nations, to global treaties of all sorts, etc. However one answers the question of neoliberalism and nationalism, it is clear that democratic contradictions between egalitarian claims and the exceptionalist sovereignty with its secularized omnipotence in service to the wealthiest few are mounting, the contradictions are mounting. Can democracy in response strengthen itself through popular not populist power through an international intersectionalism resistant within each nation to the transnationalism of the capitalist exceptionalism. In this, the voices of social movements, cultural forces, and indeed of churches become key to freeing politics from market dictates while supporting economic systems committed to a more common good, as you have had for so long, and as I understand is agonizingly threatened in Swedish social democracy. Connolly has argued that in order to be broad enough to counter what he calls the evangelical capitalist resonance machine, the coalitions, uh, national and international 
must be eco-political. And he says, as a secular writer, both secular and religious. So, two, the second apocalypse. For a political theology of the earth, a yet broader intersectionalism is demanded of us in the registers of ecology. Here we confront not just a politico-economic white man supremacism, but a species exceptionalism. The sovereign anthropos has energetically secularized, industrialized, and economized an originally theological dominion. Human anthropocentrism has produced the tragic dynamism of the Anthropocene. It has been literally energized by fossil fuels. As the Scottish theologian Michael Northcott argues in his political theology of climate change, the coal-fired English Industrial Revolution that runs through fossil fuel addicted global capitalism is the primary cause. But it is a human exceptionalism, I want to add, that provides the deep justification. And the religious rights anti-ecological reading of the Genesis Imago Dei has sanctified unrestricted extractivism, extract, extraction of fossil fuels. The United States' contribution to greenhouse gas emissions is comparable to no nations but China and India. And every day there's more bad news from the us. Methane regulation rollbacks, drilling leases that could create more climate pollution than the European Union does in a year, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Still, the Earth will persist but our human world may not. So I must share a bit of a poem by Ed Robeson titled, To See the Earth Before the End of the World. It meditates on the temporality of extinction, indeed of glacier melt. I thought it would be relevant. Parts of the poem, media note people chasing glaciers in retreat up their valleys. Watched ice was speed made invisible. Now it's days and a few feet further away, a subtle collapse of time between large and our small human extinction. You know, it's ironic that Robeson contemplating these white ice mountains melting can be described as actually our leading black eco-poet. He works, in his words, to unwhite out language. You know, to white out means to cover over <laughs> with, white, <laughs> with, with white paint. So to unwhite out is a metonym for apocalypse, disclosing. So I hope that a political theology of the earth can help uh, it can help to unwhite out the U.S. Christian right climate denialism, the whiting out of ecological responsibility. Um, and of course, <laughs> that U.S. Christian right is still, is still working hard to rid us not just of our dark forests that remain, but <laughs> certainly of dark people as well. But we must then also reveal the subtler exceptionalism that often accompanies a virtuous focus on human rights when that proceeds in complete abstraction from the material ecology. So one of the most frightening human rights uh, implications of the climate apocalypse, I think, is the way growing rates of climate-induced immigration are going to be met by the already growing antagonism against immigrants. Uh, the antagonism is largely among climate change deniers, uh, but it's as though they're rehearsing for the great waves of, of hundreds of millions of climate migrants that will come, scientists say, by the middle of the century. It's actually a Swedish study 
that showed in uh, 2006 uh, that already 46, 46 nations uh, were verging on extreme violence based on climate change. 46, the Swedish study said, and yet the Swedish study was making the point that that's hardly ever named. It's always religious or political issues or economic uh, that, get, that get named. So when the numbers of climate migrants expands exponentially, which among nations already struggling over anti-immigrant politics, uh, who's going to welcome these strangers? Which nations will practice some secularized version of the Deuteronomic love the foreigner, for you yourselves were foreigners in Egypt? Deuteronomy 10.14. Questions of human rights, which are usually framed by an individualistic and anthropocentric discourse, traditionally anyway, will not be adequately supplemented by talk of animal rights or even of earth rights. So I think we need to keep stretching our language of rights toward discourses of eco-social justice that locate the needed rights of all humans within the larger intersectionality of species, ecosystems, elements. And this is where theological cosmology is needed, at least for use within and in relation to the churches in articulating a worldview that, like Genesis, endows all creatures with life. So, the third apocalypse. So, for instance, some of us find indispensable some sense of matter itself the matter of what the creation is made of, uh, of how all of us creatures uh, become needs accounting, the account of our becoming, of our genesis. So we find ourselves then in the theology of a political theology of the earth. You might know something of process theology, and if you were in the discussion a couple of hours ago, you do, <laughs> something. It is based in Whitehead's nearly century-old cosmology of interdependent becoming, in part inspired by the new discoveries of quantum physics in the 20s, and of its role through then John Cobb from the 70s on in the theorizing and practicing of a Christian and ecumenical theology of interdependence, including Cobb's many books criticizing the destructive exceptionalism, ecological and communal of homo economicus. In the secular zone, Whitehead's vision uh, reverberates in this century uh, through what is called the new materialism. One of the leading new materialists is the feminist science theorist Karen Barad, she displays the intraactive agency, the responsiveness in play at the quantum level in that spontaneous response uh, of, the, of the quanta that can't be predicted. At the human level, we call that responsiveness responsibility, which is then a particular exemplification of, not an exception to, an ontology of relation. So she writes, each bit of matter is an enormous entangled multitude. And at my school's transdisciplinary theological colloquium on entangled worlds, we were able to draw her out more on her quantum entanglement with theology. So she ended up writing for our volume about finitude shot through with infinity and she discloses the messianic structure of matter itself. She's reading through many of her works now, a Jewish messianism uh, by way of Walter Benjamin and Judith Butler. But notice that this messianic charge of cosmology all the way down to the electron does not take away ex sipere from a particular human, uh, 
specificity or from a particular human messiah. It does, by implication, though, undo the messianic exception. Such rewriting of the micro-creatures of materiality themselves as creatures who matter helps us to locate all materialization, all embodiment in networks of deep interdependence. In The Cloud of the Impossible, uh, this book's there, I call this uh, entangled difference. That entangled difference has largely been whited out by the dominion theologically sacralized and secularized of human exceptionalism. So it becomes crucial now to name and to practice the deep intersectionalism of the earth, secular religiously. If it is with global warming that the secularized apocalypse is now heating up, disclosing its resonance with the book of Revelation, unwhiting out the apocalypse, becomes then an important theological exercise. So for me, for instance, it was the fires that come routinely now in California that took me back unexpectedly to John's apocalypse, where after the stillness in heaven for 30 minutes at the opening of the seventh seal, one third of the trees of the earth burn. And this August, 31,000 fires tore through the Amazon with Bolsonaro, Brazil's trumper, cheering them on. <laughs> Indifferent to the great carbon extraction service that those rainforests render to all, <laughs> all of the Earth's life. Uh, and certainly in great indifference uh, from him to all of uh, the dark trees and the dark bodies. As the Brazilian Archbishop Kreutler put it accurately, Amazon fires are true apocalypse. And then in Revelation, one third of the life of the seas dies, waters turn to blood, quite an acidification. In August, on a little island in Alaska, I learned that at the bottom of the sea chain of life, and so of all food chains, is the plankton, threatened by the rising temperature and its acidification and was shocked, of the ocean, and was shocked to hear that the bigger problem is that at least half, at least 50%, but maybe 85% of the oxygen that we breathe is produced by these now very threatened sea plankton. Uh, so one of the naturalists, uh, who was a guy, was saying that human suffocation, mass human suffocation, is another possibility for the turn of the next century. I just hadn't known about that one. So we now deny our intricate cross-species entanglement <laughs> at great peril of our own species. But was John of Potmos predicting any of this? Well, no, of course not. Prophecy is not the same as prediction. Prophecy is reading, I even sometimes now call it dream reading, deep civilizational tendencies. So remembering that the German word for dream, Traum, is the root of trauma, I think it's important uh, to do our own dream readings of the apocalypse now, and so perhaps to offer theological therapy for the traumatism of climate crisis so that it can be more adequately confronted instead of just shifting people, right, from their nice capitalist middle-class optimism into complete despair and pessimism, which is just as irresponsible. In the U.S. context, uh, theological as well as secular publics seem constantly now to spiral between denialism and nihilism, between it is our right and it is too late. So from the alpha of creation to the omega of apocalypse, 
Ecotheology has long traced the problem back to the misreading of Genesis, which translates the imago dei dominion as species exceptionalism, the misreading. As if for the God of Genesis, who is exuberant with delight about the goodness of each species as it emerges, as if our gifted species rendering species extinct now every day could be somehow okay as part of our privilege. So I find a certain dark hope in the messianic utterance, I am the Alpha and the Omega. It can be read as an alternative to the linear march of time from creatio ex nihilo to the end. Thus the New Jerusalem is highlighted by the growth there of the tree of life, that same tree featured in Eden. In the new city, though, the tree is now a plural creature since it grows on both sides of the river of life. Not exactly what my colleague uh, Stephen Moore, the New Testament scholar, calls uh, in his in his view of the Book of Revelation. But this it's a you know a, 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 the city is like a one big shopping mall with a single tree. A, a, what is it? A continent-sized shopping mall with a single tree. So I, I'm arguing with him about that. And following the following the root system of that tree of life to a more systematic theological symbolization, if the beginning and the end are inseparable, and if we read the Messiah as embodying the logos or principium of creation, then in a certain sense, every moment of creation materializes the alpha and the omega. So this political theology comes closer to Christological exemplarism than to the exceptionalism that drives every form of Christian supremacism. For process theology, the Christological logos names the participatory principle of creative transformation, the lure to genesis, to becoming, at every moment, everywhere. Therefore, the, lure, the, the world is lured forth not in the shape of an imperial hierarchy or a great chain of being. Rather, the creation now appears, we might say, as the great web of becoming. The divine partakes both of the interdependence and of the becoming. Whitehead could even say, God is not to be treated as an exception to all metaphysical principles invoked to save their collapse. God is their supreme exemplification. And this exemplification of interrelatedness and becoming requires a God who, like the members of the body of the ecclesia, suffers in our sufferings and joys in our joys. Hence, it's not the changeless and impassive aseity. God is in process with and in and through all that is, which makes me think of Sigurd Berkman's propositional versus, uh, versus prepositional logic, the prepositional logic of in and with and through. Of course, Paul's letter to the Corinthians echoes here. So all will be made alive in the Mashiach, Christos, so that God may be all in all, in 1 Corinthians 15. Intriguingly, the main non-theistic continental authors of political theology, Agamben, Badiou, Zizek, all go to the radical Paul, the messianic, anti-imperial Paul, uh, so they're not, they're, they remain atheists, but they love Paul. So maybe we can now speak of a political theology. Jokes in English, they just don't work. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that one did. <laughs> in a process eschatology, the becoming all in all is not for a future distant endpoint. It's happening, it's in process. 
and it invites but does not guarantee a good outcome for the earth. For the divine will is understood here as a power, a power of attraction and of compassion, but not of control. Hence, the theological deconstruction of the notion of an all-controlling omnipotence becomes crucial to energizing an alternative to the Schmidtian political theology of the omnipotent exception. In the church, such a challenge to, to omnipotence troubles many, as it seems to weaken God's sovereignty. And just as disturbing, it breaks up the certitude that begins with the creatio ex nihilo, which is, as I argued years ago, uh, make, uh, made possible by a specifically sexist appeal to omnipotence. But an absolute origin has no basis in the Bible, in which the beginning is not nothing. There's no nothing there unless you call the earth tohu vabohu, darkness over the tehom, and spirit vibrating with the waves of the mayim, nothing. But, but creation, this, this God of creation, certainly with process theology, indeed with Bonhoeffer, with Moltmann in the crucified God, does affirm a divine vulnerability, a God who suffers. With Paul, the weakness of God is stronger than human strength. And for process thought, that is the strength of a compassion, that divine strength <laughs> in its vulnerability, a suffering with that is moved by all, moved by all the sensitive, passionate bodies. So, a healing political theology in the Anthropocene will hew close, for instance, to Elizabeth Gerle's interpretation of Luther, love, body, and sensuous pleasure in her passionate embrace. Her book argues that Luther's appreciation of the body and its senses as a creational blessing is combined with his theology of the cross, that is, God's vulnerability as incarnated. In this voice of Swedish creation theology, divine activity through the matter of creation unfolds behind a mask, larva dei, as creatio continua. Divinity, then, is experienced not impassively in this view, but in passion, compassion, and not just that of human bodies, but of all the bodies in the universe, of which process all our earth bodies together add up to an unthinkably tiny bit. The question of weakness, indeed of failure and possible death, comes now down to a much more concrete reality, which is the actual register of this third apocalypse. For increasing numbers of thoughtful Christians, at least in the North and the West, God has died or is dying now. And even more concretely, the church, the symbolic body of Christ, seems to continue to weaken in a kind of old age the process of secularization is far more advanced in, West, in Western Europe than in the United States, but we're catching up fast, strangely enough, particularly on the side of the old line denominations. And nowhere is there any guarantee that something new is emerging that will at least secularize the best of Christianity politically, ecologically, theologically into cultural consciousness. And yet, even now, where the apocalypse of the church, remember what apocalypse means, <laughs> not the end, where the apocalypse of the church appears embedded in that of politics, which is embedded in that of the earth, I will be then repeating like a mantra or like a Gregorian chant, apocalypse is not closure, but disclosure right in the midst of probable death, it may be opening up improbable possibilities of new life. Catastrophe can become catalyst. We may not know just how or when or where or if. As in negative theology, we do learn to know what we do not know. 
And there is a depth at which apocalypsis becomes apophasis, the unspeakable. That might make for much better conversation, humbler, pluralist, experimental, open, maybe even disclosive. So a constructive theology laced with due apophasis rules out the certainties of optimism and of pessimism. Its dark hope laments the traumatic losses that have been and the traumatic losses that will be. Laments, of course, uh, for what it cannot prevent. It's like the cry, like the cry of the apocalyptic eagle in the book of Revelation, woe, woe, woe for all the inhabitants of the earth, woe, woe, woe for the, the seas and the earth. That grief perhaps allows the dark hope of new creation to emerge, to renew our collective creativity. So, <laughs> I hope, in closing, that such conversations as you in your academic and theological communities foster do not come to final closure, but always and again to spirited disclosure. Thank you for your patience.